So we're going to go into our questions, and we have about 15 minutes. And Maureen has the mic. So if you have a question for one of our panelists, please. OK. Hi, my name is MC Bredner, and um, I just wanted to thank Wendy for her presentation, because I um, also do research in it with people with episodic disabilities. And throughout my research, one of the things that um, has been the most frustrating for me was this comment that workers would tell me that, that they were lucky because they had an employer that would give them the accommodation that they need. And uh, you referred to it as soft accommodations. And I also work um, as a union rep for the United Steel Workers, and I negotiate with employers all the time, and we deal a lot with episodic disabilities. And the thing that's really hard to get employers to understand is those fluctuating needs. And I was just wondering if you have suggestions or systemic policy suggestions that we can advocate for that would actually um, help workers with episodic disabilities to try to help employers figure out or understand that these accommodations are needed and are part of that um, requirement that they have, whereas, because right now I feel that a lot of employers just kind of sideline those soft accommodations as being a worker who is, um, you know, playing the system or doesn't actually need it because some days they can do that and some days they can't do that and they have a hard time negotiating that. Thank you. It's, it's a great question, um, and I wish I had an easy answer. I think there's a lot wrapped up in your question, right? So one of the things that you're asking about is policy frameworks that could be implemented in a, at an employment level. Um, CUPE has a statement on HIV uh, at work, and they have actually, it's the first one that I've seen, they've, um, they've put into the statement the concept of episodic disability. So it actually shows up as a conceptual model, a way of thinking about disability. And I think I'll send you a link to it, and if anybody else is interested in seeing it, it's great to see it reflected that way because it's the first time that I've seen it reflected in kind of a, um, uh, a big policy document. Uh, one of the problems is, and I was saying, we don't have a formal uh, definition of episodic disability. It's a really new concept, too. Um, really, the, the definition that I quoted there is one that we've used for years, but there, there isn't a broad-based agreement. There, we, the episodic disability population, as we've been talking about, doesn't exist in a lot of the, the data, too, right? So this is a new thing. Um, although I am happy to say that in the 2017 uh, Canada Survey on Disability, um, there is a marker for episodic disability in the new one. So we, we worked, a number of us worked with uh, StatsCan to come up with some questions for that. So moving forward, at least there'll be some data to fall back on in terms of understanding what the policy should be. Um, one of the things I think that you're talking about is stigma too. Uh, and I think we, we really haven't talked about it very much here, but certainly in my work with people with HIV, um, and for people who work with people living with mental health issues too, there's a lot of stigma there as well. And, and one of the main things that I think the evidence has shown in terms of reducing stigma, when you can do it, is contact with somebody who's willing to talk about their lived experience, right? To be able to say, I'm a person living with, these are the kinds of things that I need at work. Not, not an employee necessarily, but somebody from external uh, organization. So I don't know if that helps, but. We can connect after, maybe, too. Great. Thank you. Maureen, you have another person with a question? Hi. Hi. I'm Douglas Waxman. I'm a doctoral student at uh, York's Critical Disability uh, Studies Program. It's not a question as much as a comment. Um, I'm concerned about the use of the word adjustments. Mm -hmm. um, the word adjustments sounds like a, and I, and I fully appreciate the need to talk business speak when you're talking to businesses and it sounds less threatening, but it sounds charitable as opposed to a right. And I think it's much more powerful and uh, employers need to know that people are entitled to reasonable accommodations um, and that those were hard fought, right? You know, there are people in this room who have worked very hard at, or at least predecessors who worked very hard to get that into it and and what is what is um, it's not legally defined right reasonable accommodation is legally defined so anyways I, I just wanted to pass that on mm -hmm. great thank you anybody want to speak to that 
Can I, can I just make a comment? In, I, I worked in the UK for a number of years and they use the term reasonable adjustments and it's used in the same way that we use accommodations. My concern, and I know somebody was talking about the legal context, we live, we would live in a legal context, right? And my concern about the switching of the terminology is that where are the protections? So if the protections are tied to an understanding of accommodation, it's really important that we, we maintain that because as we all know, you can be in a position to have to defend your right to an accommodation, right? Okay. My name is uh, Alexis Butkin, and I am a researcher, so I have a question based on previous research, and I wrote it down so I'd stay on time. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> previous <Thank you>. research <laughs> indicates that job seekers with disabilities are at least somewhat dissatisfied with employment services, claiming that providers do not effectively include them in their own hiring practices or in the design and implementation of services and supports. So my question is um, sort of geared towards the presentation on CCRW's work, and I'm wondering how CCRW ensures that services are accountable to job seekers with disabilities rather than accountable to funders, because we know that there's challenges around funding mechanisms for service providers. So I was wondering if you could speak to some of your innovations in that area. Sure. Thank you. Um, thanks, Kathy. Um, it starts with employment and it starts with um, you know having the one-on-one -on -one conversations with those job seekers and then being involved in every step of the process and ensuring that um, you know their privacy is also protected in that process and that's something that we talk a lot um, you know from as with for CCRW we talk a lot about that with our uh, our frontline staff and our job developers who are working one-on-one -on -one, uh, across the country with job seekers who are looking to get into the labor market or back to work. And um, one of the things that we hear all the time is, you know, the types of questions and the way we engage in conversation with job seekers is, is really involving them in the process. And it's a client-driven approach. Um, you know, we're not out there selling disability to employers. We're matching the skills that the people we serve have with the need that we've recognized in a, that employers have. So uh, I think from CCRW, the programs that we have, specifically our largest program, which is the Partners Program, which is in 10 sites across Canada, um, what we're hearing is that, you know, because it's a client-driven approach, because, you know, they're being a part of that process and we're listening to them and, and we understand the employer's need, that that sense of satisfaction is there with the level of service that we provide. So. My name is Chris Hornberger and I'm a management consultant in uh, Halifax and uh, my question is for Beth. Um, I've uh, been on a board for entrepreneurs with disabilities uh, for about five years and um, um, we don't provide loans or anything like that so it's primarily mentorship and supports of one kind or another and the funding for EDN comes from, uh, from various government agencies. Um, and I'm interested to know your success rate in terms of uh, entrepreneurs with mental health illness staying in business. And how many of those businesses are essentially self-employment versus, uh, versus business, you know, where they're engaging other, uh, other employees and, uh, and have, looking for growth in their business and so on? Thank you for the question. Is it Brian Aird that you work with? Yeah, okay, I've spoken with Brian. Um, so your question was about um, our success rates, and there are a couple of different ways that we measure success. In an ideal world, we would be in contact with every single person we've ever worked with, and they would be reporting to us regularly on, on you know, their business success. Um, we try very hard to do that. Um, but sometimes it's difficult to keep track of people. So what I will say is there are a couple of different things that we track. We track our repayment rates, for example, the people that pay back our loans. And, and right now we're sitting at about 7% default, so that's pretty good. It's comparable to, to, to uh, a bank that would be lending to small businesses. And your other question was about how many people are, are starting businesses and creating jobs as opposed to just starting businesses for themselves. And um, to be honest, we don't make the distinction. Our, our purpose at RISE is to help people um, start businesses for themselves. And so it's probably safe to say that the majority of businesses that we start are micro-businesses. 
Um, and that could be something in the skilled trade, somebody who is a drywaller. That could be somebody who is a, a caterer. Um, so, uh, so we don't have really great statistics on job creation, and we don't we don't um, we don't tell our funders that we will have those statistics because they're hard to find. Um, but we do keep it t keep track of our of our entrepreneurs. And as I said, when I was up there, not all of them stay with their businesses, but but they do learn and, and acquire skills. So, um, but for the most part, they are smaller businesses. That doesn't mean there aren't some people that we fund that that. Um, that end up hiring a lot of people because there are, but for the most part, they're sole proprietors. Okay, well, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mary Gasella. Again, thank you for those very interesting presentations. Uh, my question uh, relates to your comments, Wendy, about episodic disabilities, because uh, one of the areas that uh, is particularly difficult for people who have such disabilities relates to the Canada Revenue Agency Disability Tax Credit, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, very, very, um, uh, is applied in such a way that very few people with an episodic disability could ever qualify. Yeah. And it remains a serious issue because with the uh, ineligibility for a disability tax credit also comes the crashing down of a a registered disability mm -hmm. savings plan that the person may have been putting money into and losing uh, a lot of money for having to cash it out. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you're right. It, it is a huge issue. And in fact, it's something that we've been just recently talking about again at the Episodic Disability Forum. So we have a forum that, that has um, many of the folks in here are members. Uh, so representatives from organizations that represent people living with episodic disabilities as well as researchers and other folks that have an interest in the area. And we've just recently been talking about this question again. So what do we do about um, how exclusive the, the disability tax credit is to people living with episodic disabilities? Um, I was talking to Margaret Parler, do you know Margaret? From the National CFME Action Network. Uh, about this and they've been doing some some letter writing and they feel like they've had a, some success recently uh, I guess there has been a committee struck to look at the disability tax credit again so hopefully we'll be in a position to um, submit something to the committee to to reconsider this because as you say it locks you out of a whole series of things I got the five minute mark so we just have time for one more question Thank you very much. My name is Bill Shador. I'm the National Coordinator for the Canadian Indian Workers Alliance. And I just wanted to make a couple of observations, if I may. Um, one of the things is that I know it was mentioned a couple of times, but it just mentioned earlier, but episodic um, disabilities or whatever. Um, what we are, have done over the last two years, uh, we've been working with an organization called the Canadian Pain Coalition. And we put together a project which we received some funding for from the federal government and some organizations that have given us money as well. But it basically, it's got a long title and I'm gonna try to find a way to shorten it. But it's called Creating a Way Forward, Developing Guides for Collaborative Practice and Support for Injured Workers Who Live and Work with Chronic Pain. And it's, uh, we've had a couple of uh, forums on the issue with face-to-face -face meetings. It included doctors, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, psychologists, and we had a lot of professionals who wanted to have a say in the whole issue of chronic pain and how it's dealt with in this country and how people are trying to get into the workforce or return to the workforce after being injured. I'd just like to pose one quick question. How many people in this room are injured workers who have, are dealing with chronic pain? Quite a few, I have one here. So it, we don't have a, a really good uh, number or statistics on that particular issue and we're trying to find ways of getting that and we're hoping as we go along on this project and we're hoping to further this project and to also get into other details like data on that issue alone because the whole issue of chronic pain and persistent pain in this country it's basically uh, it's cost about 50 billion dollars as an estimate and it's also estimated that one in five people at some point are going to wind up with chronic pain or persistent pain of some kind. That's a staggering statistic when you think about it. So I just wanted to actually talk about that, tell you about what we're doing. We just did a webinar uh, last week, I think it was, on the issue as uh, part of the project we're doing. It's on our website, uh, Canadian Engine Workers, uh, or CIWA dot, dot what? 
Dossier? Okay. <laughs> Office manager Janet is here. <laughs> Keep me honest. So if anybody also wants to be involved in the project, I know I've been talking with Steve about this and other things that we're hoping to be involved in. Uh, just let us know. Contact us at, uh, at our uh, website email address. Okay? Thank you. All right. We're finished and we're three minutes under. We've got one last question. Three minutes. Um, just a quick question um, with regards to, I think it was Aaron that was addressing sort of that disability prevention and then CCRW has sort of this new concept of contractual agreement as far as the service that you provide for the, that match for the talent. So my question is, in the identification of everything that I've done, barrier still is the most challenging thing to look at. You say that you identify barriers and solve that issue in order to ensure that there is the greater percentage of disability prevention. You're saying that you have a contractual obligation to those you serve on both sides of the equation. How do you manage the identification of those barriers? Uh, CCR Use the microphone. Uh, CCRW is lucky enough to have a social enterprise called JAZZ, which is our job accommodation services. Um, and that is um, something that we're able to use with employers, employees, um, as well as um, you know, anyone else in the process. It was actually, it was part of my presentation, but given my time limit, I, so I jumped over a few, uh, a few parts. But um, that allows CCRW um, you know, on both sides of that contract to um, come in with an occupational therapist, um, you know, at work, prior to going to work, and facilitate, um, you know, having that accommodation piece to ensure um, that some of those barriers are no longer there. But, you know, the key to that is that ongoing support and that conversation, to, like you said earlier, Jamie, to, um, to make sure that you're doing that check-in. Is that still working? What can we do better? How can you be your best self at work? So, you know, CCRW can utilize uh, Jazz as an employer can independently of CCRW to ensure that they have that service available, um, you know, for that accommodation piece. And, you know, when you're putting those pieces into play, um, you're able to work towards that prevention, um, you know, for, for any further, um, you know, injury at work or, you know, to ensure that an individual is their best self at work. Um, we do have a representative from our jazz team here, Emily, uh, if anyone else is interested uh, in learning more about that. Great. Thanks. Erin? Button or is it I on? think so, yeah, or it should be coming on automatically. Okay, and I'll just be quick too, and I was doing similar to, to Megan, I was kind of realizing I was running out of time, so I didn't get to go into the full sales pitch, but that would be something that's um, looked at through the situational assessment, um, and then the report that gets produced, which essentially is, again, identifying the gaps, identifying where um, improvements are needed, um, and then we devise essentially uh, a plan based on the individual needs of the of the employer. So it's my quick answer. Great. You can come and see me and Jody <laughs> and talk more. So <laughs> absolutely. So we're at 4:30. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate all your presentations. Really, thanks so much. We're at 4:30. Wow.